are looking for a man in a new Mercury Cougar. Exactly like this one. He's a dangerous double agent and a master of disguise. Haven't seen him. When Mercury ended in 2010, the overall car fandom shrugged their collective shoulders. This brand that was intended to be a middle option between a Ford and a Lincoln had long before succumbed to badge engineering and half-baked plans of models from other manufacturers. This is a far too brief history of Mercury. So welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I am John, and I have fond memories of Mercury from my youth, but I've always struggled to really like them, with the exception of a few individual products. For most of my life, Mercury was just nice Ford, with a bit of chrome and nothing to really make it worth the premium price. To me, they never really differentiated themselves as well as Olds or Buick did from say a Chevy. Not surprisingly, looking back on their history, it is a mess with a nearly constant shuffle of nameplates and platforms, but leading to some successes along the way. Now, Mercury was formed in 1938 by Edsel Ford, yeah, that Edsel, to be the Ford answer to Buick and Oldsmobile in the mid-priced segment, and to bridge the gap between Ford and Lincoln. In 1935, Ford had only Ford and Lincoln to compete against the seven different brands of General Motors and the four that Chrysler had. Ford had the standard deluxe V8, and Lincoln had the Model K, which was amongst the most expensive cars sold in the U.S., rivaling the Cadillac V12, a Duesenberg, or the Mercedes and Rolls-Royce brands. Inspired by the companion make program that GM had done, where new nameplates were created without making them a whole separate brand, this is just what GM did with Oakland when they created Pontiac, Ford launched the Lincoln Zephyr as a submark and made the Deluxe a submark of Ford, but then created Mercury as a completely new third brand in this strategy. In November 1948, the Mercury 8 was introduced at the New York Auto Show with a two-door, four-door, two-door convertible, and a two-door trunked sedan as options. It was a hit selling over 65,000 vehicles its first year. In response, Ford returned the Deluxe to a trim line, not a companion brand. In 1941, the Mercury was redesigned and fittingly with its future to come with its share of a body shell from Ford, but it had a four inch longer wheelbase. It also received its own grille, trim, and tail lamps. For 42, the 8 got a dashboard similar to the upscale Lincoln Zephyr. The Ford Flathead V8 was offered with 100 horsepower and the Liquimatic semi automatic transmission that was both complex and unreliable. With production suspended for World War II, only 24,704 Mercuries were produced for 1942. After the war and with the rise of Henry Ford II, Ford's divisional structure was once again changed. Mercury was merged with Lincoln, forming the surprising Lincoln Mercury division. You may have heard of it. In 46, Mercury's were essentially the same as 42 models, but with minor revisions and no liquimatic transmission option. In 1949, Ford launched an all-new post-war design, and now the Mercury and Lincolns shared a body shell and were distinguished by headlights and grills with slightly different interiors. They all shared versions of that Ford flathead. And this version of Mercury became extremely popular, very famous, and very successful as a street rod modification. The massive success of that 1949 version led to a six-fold increase in sales, and Mercury was now the sixth most popular brand in the U.S. In 1950, the Monterey name was used for the first time on a Mercury as a special edition of the two-door coupe, and in 51, Mercury got its version of Ford's new three-speed automatic, dubbed the Merc-O-Matic. God, I miss those old brand names. In 1952, Mercury redesigned the line, replacing the 1.8 with two nameplates. First, the Monterey was its own model line and shared bodies with Lincoln and the Custom. By 53, and as the economy recovered from its post-war doldrums, Mercury hit a high point of market share with 5%. 
In 54, Ford replaced the flathead V8 that dated back to 1932 with a Y-block overhead valve V8, and Mercury got its own version of it. They also released the Monterey Sun Valley with a fixed acrylic sunroof that allowed the car to feel open and airy, but also became a little bit of a terrarium in warmer climates. It didn't last until 1956. In 1955, the Mercury line was again redesigned, now with a three model range, the Montclair at the top, the Monterey, and the Custom. And in 1956, the Custom was renamed the Metalist since there was already a Ford Custom. Again, it kind of feels like they just didn't really have a plan. In 1957, the lineup was again redesigned with a 122-inch wheelbase to place it between Ford and Lincoln. The slow-selling Metalist was canceled with the Monterey becoming the standard of the lineup and the Turnpike Cruiser slotted above the Montclair as the flagship. In 1958, Ford once again revised its divisional structure, this time to make room for the ill-fated Edsel. Mercury, Edsel, and Lincoln were all combined into one division, and the Edsel Citation and Corsair were sharing chassis roofline and overlapping in price with Mercury's. The Turnpike Cruiser was made part of the Montclair line, and the Park Lane was introduced as the new flagship model with a 125-inch wheelbase. They also introduced a 7.0 liter Marauder V8 as an option on all cars with a Super Marauder version with 400 horsepower, becoming the first mass-produced engine to make 400 horsepower. The economic downturn of the 50s hit mid-priced brands the hardest. While Edsel ended up being discontinued, there was a movement in Ford to streamline and cancel both Mercury and Lincoln. Ultimately, Ford President Robert McNamara continued Mercury with several conditions. Lincoln shrunk their cars and kept only the Continental. The division shifted to a nine-year model cycle, and Mercury was to adopt Ford bodies on their own wheelbase. The number of divisional bodies produced by Ford dropped from five down to two by 1961. In 1960, Mercury entered the compact car segment with the Comet, beating GM to this market by about a year. This was originally intended to be an Edsel and was sold without Mercury badging until 1962. It was a stretched version on 114-inch wheelbase of the Ford Falcon and became the first Mercury without a V8 with its standard inline 90 horsepower 6. In 1961, they introduced new full-size cars based on the Ford Galaxy. The Montclair and Park Lane were withdrawn, and the Meteor was introduced as the entry-level full-size, a car also originally designed as an Edsel. In 1962, they revised their lineup again. The Meteor was applied to an intermediate name, the counterpoint of the Ford Fairlane. 1964, the Montclair and Park Lane were reintroduced above the Monterey and the Meteor was dropped. And in 65, the full size were redesigned, taking many styling cues from Lincoln. There was a move here to make them more like Lincoln once again. In 1967, two of Mercury's most successful nameplates were introduced, the Cougar and the Marquis. The Cougar was based off the Mustang and intended to bridge a gap between it and the T-Bird. The Marquis was a counterpoint of the Ford LTD and was a nameplate that would continue in various forms until ultimately Mercury was killed off. Unsurprisingly, Mercury revised its model range once again in 1968. The Montego replaced the Comet, now as an intermediate, based on the Ford Torino, and the Cyclone was moved from a performance version of the Comet to a standalone model above the Cougar. <sighs> Sigh. In 1969, the Park Lane and Montclair were discontinued. The Marauder became a standalone with a 429 cubic inch V8, and the Marquis got hidden headlamps to differentiate itself from the Monterey. In the 1970s, Mercury refocused on higher content vehicles and started de-emphasizing sportier cars, sort of. They entered the subcompact segment in 1970 with the Capri imported from Germany. Smaller than a Pinto, it was marketed as a compact sports car rather than an economy car. And interestingly, it was the first Ford product 
in North America sold with a V6. Also interesting, for its run from 1970 to 1978, it was not sold with Mercury badging. In 1971, the Cougar was restyled but positioned to compete against the Chevy Monte Carlo, the Olds Cutlass Supreme, and the Pontiac Grand Prix. The Comet made a return as the counterpoint to the Ford Maverick, itself based on the 1960 Comet. Surprisingly, in 1971, Lincoln Mercury began selling the De Tommaso Pantera and ended up selling 5,500 of them through 1975. By 1973, model year, the intermediate Montego line, based on the Ford Gran Torino, was redesigned and grew. The Cyclone was canceled, and much of the line got updates to meet increasing safety standards, including phasing out convertibles. In 1974, the Cougar was redesigned and now based off the Torino chassis and styled as the Mercury option to the T-Bird. By this point, the model lineup was confusion, <laughs> but after the canceling of the Monterey, the new Grand Marquis was introduced. The Monarch was introduced and successfully positioned as a luxury compact car. 1976, Mercury finally got its version of the Pinto called the Bobcat. The Capri was restyled and renamed the Capri II and became the second most imported car to the U.S. after the Beetle. By 1977, the middle of Mercury's lineup was selling poorly, so they started to make some changes. The Montego was dropped, the Cougar expanded to include a sedan and station wagon bodies, and now the counterpoints of the LTD II. The Cougar XR7 being the counterpoint to the T-Bird. While it may sound like heresy, Cougar sales nearly tripled with these changes. In 1978, the Zephyr was introduced, a compact car replacing the Comet and the counterpart of the Ford Fairmont, and notably, the introduction of the Fox platform, a platform Ford would use well into the early 2000s. Notably, they sold 580,000 vehicles and 40% were Cougars. In 1979, the Marquis was downsized. The Capri returned now as a counterpart to the Mustang. The redesign of the Marquis and strong Cougar sales boosted Mercury to its all-time sales peak of nearly 670,000 units. Between 1978 and 1982, Mercury redesigned its entire lineup and began diversifying its model range, both with Ford products as well as rebadged versions of vehicles from other manufacturers. Designers tried to give Mercury its own brand identity separate from Ford, but the brand continued to create look-alike copies, badge engineering. By 1982, the Bobcat and the Monarch were ended, the Mercury Lynx was introduced, a counterpart to the Ford Escort, as well as its first two-seat vehicle, the LN7, which was a counterpart to the Ford EXP. In 1983, the Cougar XR7 got an aerodynamic exterior redesign along with its counterpart, the T-Bird. The Cougar name was also dropped from sedans and wagons and became the Marquis, and the Grand Marquis became its own model line based on the Crown Victoria. The compact Zephyr was discontinued and the disappointing sales of the LN7 left it cancelled. Strong sales of the Cougar led to Mercury being the fifth highest selling brand in 1983 the best it would ever do. The front-wheel drive Topaz debuted in 1984 as the counterpart of the Ford Tempo. This continued Ford's use of more aerodynamic design and was the first Lincoln Mercury to offer an optional driver's side airbag and introduce the new Mercury logo. A successful launch, the Topaz helped the division reach about 500,000 in sales. 1986 was a pivotal year. The Sable was introduced as the companion the counterpart to the Taurus and replaced the Marquis, while offering a few items different such as C-pillars, tail lamps, and a light bar grille to distinguish it from its Ford brother. The light bar went on to be a distinguishing feature of many Mercuries for much of the 80s. In 1988, the Grand Marquis got a substantial exterior redesign. The Topaz was redesigned to help differentiate it some more from the Tempo, and the Mercury Tracer replaced the links between 1987 and 1989. This was based on the Ford Laser, which is itself based on the Mazda 323, and would show an increasing use of foreign designs in Mercury's plans. 
1989 was the 50th anniversary of the division and multiple commemorative editions of cars got produced. The Sable got an exterior update and the Cougar and the T-Bird, of course, got a ground up redesign, being slightly smaller but on a longer wheelbase and was benchmarked against European coupes. A special note is that in 1985, Ford imported its Sierra XR4i from Europe and named it the Mercure XR4Ti, taking the name Mercure from the German word for Mercury. They marketed these cars through Mercury Division and seeking to recapture some of that success they had of importing the Capri in the 1970s. And in 1988, it was joined by the Scorpio, also from Ford of Europe, but Overall, this was a dismal failure, and it was canceled in 1989, and it is one of the shortest-lived brands in modern American automotive history. In 1991, the Capri returned, this time as a two-door, four-seat convertible produced by Ford of Australia and intended to compete against the Miata, but based on the Mazda 323. The Tracer returned as well as a clone of the Escort, and both of those were based on the Mazda Protégé. 1992 saw two of the division's biggest sellers get major, major redesigns. The Sable retained only its doors and its roof, but remained a new interpretation of the original style. The Grand Marquis got a major update as well. Got an all-new body, but the carryover chassis got a major upgrade to handling, and the car got its first overhead cam V8 in an American brand car. This redesign was much better received than GM's work on the Caprice or the Roadmaster, and the Grand Marquis went on to be the best-selling Mercury sedan through much of the 90s. In 1994, Mercury got its first minivan, the Villager. Oddly, Ford never attempted to bring its own minivan, the Aerostar, to Mercury, but partnered with Nissan for one, the Quest, and ended up using an old name for a Mercury wood-trimmed station wagon. Size between the two Chrysler offerings, it helped Mercury sales to about 480,000. After 94, the Capri was canceled with poor sales, and in 95, the Topaz was replaced by the Mystique, the near twin of the Ford Contour. This platform honestly deserves its own video as a massive investment by Ford to create a world car led to a car that handled well but was criticized for being too small inside and is often heard to have had terrible reliability. In 1996, the Sable got its next redesign with Ford putting forth the effort to make it more different than the Taurus. This new design was not well received and sales fell. In 97, the Tracer was redesigned along with the Escort and only differed in grille and badging. In 1997, Mercury also left into the SUV craze with the Mountaineer, a Ford Explorer by any other name but standard V8 and all-wheel drive and a different grille. And as the T-Bird was canceled, so too was the Cougar, at least temporarily. The Mercury Grand Marquis benefited from the cancellation of the GM, Roadmaster, and Capri models, with sales increasing nearly 20% from 1996 to 1997. And in 1999, the Cougar returned, this time as a version of the Ford Probe and based on the Mystique platform, but designed only for Mercury. The Villager was redesigned as well. Through the 2000s until the vision was ended, Mercury attempted to revitalize their lineup while attracting younger buyers in spite of the fact that their best-selling model was the Grand Marquis. In 99, the Tracer and Mystique sales were ended, leaving only the Cougar, Grand Marquis, and Sable as their cars. The Cougar had dismal sales and was canceled in 2002. By 2002, the Mountaineer got its hand-me-down version of the ground-up redesign of the Explorer, but with new and more distinct styling. And that was the final year of the Villager. While the last redesign of the Grand Marquis changed the body on largely the same chassis, it now received minor exterior changes with a near-complete redesign of the chassis. In 2004, when Ford had its own minivan, the Freestar, Mercury got its own version of the Monterey as a direct competitor to the Chrysler Town & Country. 2005, Mercury doubled its SUV offerings to two with the Mariner, 
based off the Ford Escape, which was itself based off another Mazda platform. The Sable was quietly retired and placed with the Montego, essentially a Ford 500, and the Milan based on the Ford Fusion. For the first time since 1940, the division did not offer a station wagon. The Mountaineer was redesigned again in 2006, and the first hybrid Mercury was introduced in the Mariner, along with the brand's first CVT. In 2007, the Monterey minivan was discontinued. In 2008, the Montego was updated and named the Sable in an effort to further differentiate itself from its Ford brethren and got a more powerful drivetrain and some new styling. The Milan now outsold the Grand Marquis and the Mariner was redesigned. In 2009, the Sable was canceled as full-size cars were selling poorly and in 2010, the new generation of the Ford Taurus was developed without any Mercury counterpart. In June 2010, Ford announced it would close Mercury at the end of the year when it had about 1% of the market. Of a historic note, it's surprising to hear that Mercury had sold less vehicles at the end than either Oldsmobile or Plymouth prior to their discontinuation. In conclusion, Mercury as a company had some high points and some highlights, but through most of its history really failed to stand out, with few exceptions, I get that. Through most of the 50s and 60s, I was struck by the near constant shuffle of names and platforms, but seldom is there this feeling that Ford had any idea what to do with the brand. From the outside and looking in and looking back in time, it feels like they, they felt they needed Mercury to compete against Olds and Buick, but no real idea of how to invest in platforms, bodies, and interiors to make them stand out, make them distinct, and make them worth a premium price. After researching this video, my opinion was actually reinforced that Ford literally just threw models at Mercury, often without a strategy, invested minimally to make them different, to make them better, and they were alternately shocked when sales either fell or when they rose. As the end neared, they pulled models from other manufacturers such as Nissan and Monda, Mazda, and again, alternately expanding the lineup or simplifying it back down. Models such as the McCour or the Capri were half-baked ideas that didn't feed into a cohesive plan of what Mercury truly was. Declining sales led them to being shut down, but in the 2000s it feels and appears that Ford was simply not trying. New Ford products such as the Focus, Edge, Flex, its new SUVs, and others were never even considered as Mercury options. By the final years, only three models were available. The Mariner, the Milan, and the Grand Marquis. In short, it's hard to miss a company that had some brief moments of rich history, really attractive cars, a few memorable products, but for 30 years was a hodgepodge of models with no cohesive identity or any real reason you would need to choose them over their Ford counterpart other than little bits of chrome. Thanks for watching, guys. Rivaling, rivaling.